Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology. Uh, my name is Courtney Soderberg. I'm the Statistical and Methodological Consultant at the Center for Open Science. Um, and this webinar is going to be done by my two uh, colleagues, Alex, Alex Dennis and Tim Arrington. I'll let them introduce themselves. All right. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so I'm going to start off. So I'm going to I'll introduce myself quick. I'll let Alex introduce herself. And then um, what we'll do is I'll give a, an overview um, and, and dive in a little bit. And then Alex can take it from there. So I'm Tim Arrington. I'm the Meta Science Manager here at the Center for Open Science and um, the lead on the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology um, that we'll be talking about. And my name is Alex Dennis. I'm a research coordinator on the Reproducibility Project for Cancer Biology. Great. So this is pretty timely. Um, we thought that this would be a great opportunity to talk about our project um, and more importantly to talk about how we're coordinating our project, how we're using the open science framework and the, um, in our case, the statistical program R um, to manage our entire workflow. So the Reproducing Project in Cancer Biology is a collaboration between the Center for Open Science and Science Exchange um, and we're partnering with the open access uh, journal eLife um, to conduct independent replications of uh, previously published high-impact cancer biology papers from the years 2010 to 2012. Um, and we received funding from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation for this. And the idea for this project is to get a initial estimate of what the uh, replicability rate is in high-impact cancer biology papers, as well as trying to understand the challenges in conducting a project or even just conducting replications. Um, and hopefully this will then uh, start to be uh, an experiment that can provide more information about how to improve reproducibility and replicability um, in cancer biology and in science more generally. Um, so shortly, not that long ago, uh, last month, um, I guess almost a month ago, we published the first uh, results from that project. Um, so uh, these are the five papers that we published um, and eLife is publishing a format called uh, registered reports. Um, I know that we've had a webinar on that before and I'll talk about that briefly. Um, and that's what you see in the middle there. Um, and then what we published recently are these replication studies, so the results of our experimental plans. Um, we're not going to dive into any of these specific ones, but of course if anyone has any questions about these, um, by all means feel free to ask us. Um, we're happy to answer any questions or at least point you to more information. Um, instead, like I said, we're going to try to focus more on what was the process that we were trying to do um, in conducting each of these replications um, and how we're doing this for every single replication of this project. So a uh, way to kind of bring it back first is to really kind of create some definitions or at least try to define them the way that we're looking at them. So what is reproducibility and, and, and replicability? Um, so there's a couple different definitions that um, are worthwhile to mention. One is just computational reproducibility. So if we took, you know, the original data or anybody's data and their code, the idea there is that we should be able to rerun it and get the exact same numbers, figures that were presented in a, any given paper or any given type of presentation. Um, so that's in some ways, some people think of this as like kind of like that bare minimum. How do you reobtain the same numbers or graphs um, that was originally presented using the exact same materials? Um, another one that is important, especially in the biological sciences is empirical reproducibility. So how do I, if I wanted to, whether I do it or not, how do I understand the information to be able to rerun the experiment or the survey um, just the same way that it was conducted? So this gets a lot more at the methodology um, and the approach that was taking. So that was procedures, those you know, materials and methods. Um, and again, this is more of, again, an understanding of what one needs to do um, to conduct that same experiment. And when you take two of these and you put both computational reproducibility and empirical reproducibility together, that allows you then to really ask, about replicability, which is an independent person using those exact same methods, that exact same analysis, but using new data. So collecting new data to do this exact same thing. And then the question then is, do you get consistent results or not? And that's essentially what the heart of the project is trying to do, is to look through this entire process and, and um, both understand the challenges that are within it, but also to try to um, get at that, that last point. Can we get the same results considering everything else that we currently practice, both in the way we conduct our research and the way that we communicate our research. So others have written about this really nicely. Roger Pang had a nice article in 2011, really kind of um, highlighting computational reproducibility nicely. And one thing that I wanted to bring up here, and this is in the top right of this um, slide, is thinking about reproducibility um, as a spectrum. So if we just do what we normally do, which is I just publish results and I just publish my figures, it's really hard to understand if, uh, that entire process is reproducible, right, from that computational standpoint. 
um, you don't really get more, uh, you don't really get into a full replication until you start to look at the code, the linking of the code and the data together that then allows you to kind of think about what was being presented in that paper um, and to really reanalyze that. Um, and so this was shown um, also really nicely in terms of uh, the steps that occur um, back in 2008. So there's a really nice graphic thinking about, you know, after I conduct my experiments and I have my data, no matter what that is, at some point I start to process that data so that I can analyze it and I can compute it. Um, and then I present that data, right? I present those results as figures, as table, as numerical results that appear in the paper and that always appears as generally a text or a figure. Um, but the important part of this is thinking about how that is viewed from an author, someone who's generating that. Um, so they're starting with the hypothesis and the experimentation and the data, and they're moving it towards a paper. But you have to remember as readers, we're seeing it from the complete opposite standpoint. We're looking at that text, we're looking at that paper, trying to figure out what was actually done. Um, throughout the entire process. And so trying to you know, essentially make sense of these two is what we're trying to get at with reproducibility. Um, and then of course, figuring out how that impacts our replicability is the focus of the project. Okay, so um, what we used in our uh, project is something that um, like there's been webinars about this and, and I'm putting some links on the bottom information here uh, that you can find more information if you go to cos.io RR. Um, and also there's a previous training session last month and it sounds like there'll be another one at the end of this month talking about pre-registration and registered reports. So if you want more detail, I'd recommend signing up for that webinar um, as well as checking out the online information. But with our project, we're using this registered reports format. So if we think of, um, uh, the research lifecycle and kind of this short snippet, you know, linear um, uh, process, we start with developing an idea all the way through designing, collecting, writing up the report and publishing it. And traditionally, peer review occurs after you've written the report. But with registered reports, you have two stages of peer review. One, after you've designed that study, and two, after you've collected, analyzed the data and written the report. And that's what eLife is publishing. The registered report is that first peer review, and these replication studies is the second peer review. Um, so what we thought we'd do is kind of go through this stage with our project um, and highlight what we're doing and why we're doing it. All right, so developing an idea. Well, for us, the idea, and if we just take any one of these original papers, um, that's our idea. <laughs> our idea is to replicate what was originally done and to take uh, key conclusions from those original papers. So we're only interested in doing a subset of this um, because we're looking to sample from the literature. Um, and of course, we're trying to sample from high impact papers and kind of those more quote unquote key conclusions. Um, just because those tend to drive the field a bit more. So if we think about this, this is where we're starting, which is how anybody else starts. We start with the paper and we start with the figures. And we basically are, this is you know, the information that we all do, just consuming information, um, whether we want to replicate it or not. Um, and as we all unfortunately know, the current norm still is not to present everything. So we have nice bar graphs, but we don't have the raw data. Um, we have methods, but there's no focus on that methods. And it's pretty common as described in this one, which you see very often, which is those methods are performed elsewhere. And then you go find that paper and then you go to the next one and the next one and you go down the rabbit hole until all of a sudden there's no longer a method. <laughs> or the method is incredibly sparse and missing key uh, uh, information, whether that be the reagents or whether that be the procedure that's done. And of course, we're also missing data um, in terms of really trying to understand uh, what was actually presented. So when we did conducted our project, we started with this point and essentially uh, put out, um, with assistance from a lot of volunteers, a document of what we perceived was the necessary steps in conducting those experiments from the paper. So from the data presented in the paper, the methods in the paper, and any reference in the paper. Um, and then of course, we had our own questions instantly. Um, and those could be open-ended questions of, well, what's the catalog number of something? Or, you know, how did you, perform an experiment um, in terms of just specific details um, or and as well as also asking about data or unique materials. Um, and this is in many ways is the start of the project and, and uh, there's a lot that we hope to really kind of uh, dive into at the end of the study. Um, so I thought I'd share with you just a couple um, and these are unrelated to any of the, uh, the papers that we're doing but these are common uh, uh, concerns that come up when we when someone gets asked, and I'm sure uh, if you've done any research, you've had these exact same concerns um, trying to dig through literature in your own lab, potentially, um, which is we tend to lose a lot of this when we're trying to, tr to transfer what we've done into a paper, right? We have a lot of uh, restrictions on the text size and the amount of figures that we can present. So a lot of that nuance, that important information gets lost. Um, and then we also don't generally think about backing up having those data uh, in an easy manner uh, to recall at any given point. 
Um, and then of course, uh, they were done by different people, right? A lot of research is collaborative at this point and not everybody's even in the same lab, let, let alone the same institution. So trying to go back after the fact and figuring out is very problematic for the authors as well as anybody trying to actually follow up on that research. Um, and it's very common for people not to have the raw data. Generally, you know, it's once you've published, you've moved on. Um, and these, this information generally does not become readily accessible. Um, so these already are some of the challenges that others have talked about. And so what we're trying to see is how, does this, how do these challenges actually impact the ability to build on that research and, and see if you can obtain a similar result. All right, so after we've filled in all these details, we worked with the authors trying to get as much as we could. And if we didn't have that, we'd fill in those details ourselves. And this is what was being peer reviewed and published at eLife, um, you know, uh, the last uh, couple of years. Um, and so when we look at these, what we essentially tried to fill in at any given point was, well, what did we know that we were going to end up using um, or that we perceived that we were going to have to use? And this goes down from all the materials and the reagents. Um, and a lot of times we didn't know. They were originally unspecified. So when they weren't specified, we'd fill them in with what the lab was planning on using. Um, that included the procedures, right? Uh, again, you know, there were a lot of details that were missing. Hopefully we got them filled in by the authors, the original authors, if they could find it. And if not, then we had the lab fill it in. Um, and this is really important because this starts to get at if we are not presenting everything in the original paper and we don't have an easy means of accessing it, the next person who comes along has to start making assumptions. Um, and then of course, we also, an important part of this is figuring out, well, how many samples are we gonna use? A lot of these experiments that we're conducting are animal experiments, although we do have a lot of cell line and patient sample experiments. But the question then becomes, well, how many? How many animals do we use in any experiment? And the goal of this project is to um, you know, not have any reason not to detect the same uh, original effect size. So we use that as our point estimate um, and determine, well, how many samples would we need to have sufficient power to detect that effect? And so we do at minimum 80% power. Um, but we put all of those details as well. So all of this is in the register report that gets peer reviewed. But importantly, even at this stage, we're already making assumptions and we're doing analyses, you know, our power calculations. And so we also are starting to use the open science framework to store that information. So as a complement to each of these papers is additional materials that we can't really put into the paper in an easy format that we want to make sure that we can share with the reviewers as well as the general scientific community so they can go back and figure out how did we obtain the numbers that we obtained. Um, from our power calculations particularly. Um, and then at that stage, we move into actually conducting the experiment, which is I think what everybody wanted us to do and what we finally were able to finish uh, uh, last month for the first five. And I'm gonna pass over here to Alex to let her dive into this. Okay, so yeah, um, going off a little bit of what Tim was saying, at this point, um, we had all of our protocols put together and we've had those reviewed. And so now comes the collection of data and um, our beginning to analyze that data. So, let's see. So, a few things that I wanted to point out um, are some of the challenges or roadblocks in data collection and analysis that we had discussed and wanted to avoid in this project. Um, so, a few of those problems are collaboration with multiple people, multiple labs, multiple groups that may not be in the same institution is often difficult. And in RPCB, that was necessary. Um, as Tim said at the beginning, we're working with Science Exchange and multiple labs to go ahead and part out different parts of these protocols to reproduce or to replicate. So multiple types of data um, is going to be needed from each of these groups, um, as well as we have to find a way to get all of this data into one place. Um, we need quality control data. We need to be able to keep all of our analysis scripts and our figure generation um, in one place as well as it needs to be understood by every member of the team and everybody from these different groups. And we want to go ahead and do all of this while minimizing human error. So we have multiple analysis scripts, multiple pieces of data, um, multiple people, and we need to be able to have this clean process of getting it from data collection to eventually publication of that manuscript with as few errors as possible along the way. Um, okay. So a typical example before we move on of how this process might look is that we would have science exchange and COS gather the reagents, as Tim was talking about earlier, and put together the protocols. Um, we would have quality control tests that would need to occur before experimentation. The results of those tests would need to be shared with everybody on the team. The lab would go ahead and collect the data. COS would help with analyzing that data and putting together the figures and then the manuscript will eventually be published. So by the time we have that finished manuscript product, we have all of these different groups touching all of the different phases of this. So 
Um, I want to go over a little bit how we were able to manage that. All right, so um, the first thing that I spoke about was collaboration. We obviously have to reach out to and communicate with a lot of people through the life of this, pro of this project. Um, so what we really tried to utilize was the OSS contributors tool. So as you can see here, this is just an example of one of our replication studies, study 19, that was published and a few of the contributors who were involved. So we have each of the contributors and the permissions that we were able to adjust um, based on what was necessary to work with everybody. And this really helped in making sure that we were all on the same page. We all had access to everything that we needed access to and we could move forward without any communication error. So a typical process, um, for example, as to how this would work, would we, ha we would have all of those contributors on the previous page and they would have access to different protocols within the experiment or in some cases, multiple protocols within the same experiment if the lab was working with multiple um, protocols. And they would be able to go ahead and upload all of the relevant data files to each relevant component by just dragging and dropping all of their data. And this is not just data files this is in Excel spreadsheets, this is all of their um, scanned lab notes that they may have uh, that, as Tim mentioned earlier, often doesn't get surfaced. This could be any preliminary analysis that they may wish to do, any figures, any images, um, scans. Everything can be uploaded by the individual labs at, those point, at that point. So also, there is a recent activity tracker on the OSF that we can use to see the progress made. So in this example, you can see that this lab has added a xenograph control file. And you can set, we set our notifications to see when that stuff comes in so that we're always on top of all of these studies, um, especially since we have 20 plus going on at the same time. <clears throat> okay, so these are just a couple examples of the data files that we can store and preview and have been storing and previewing on the OSF. So we've got an HPLC report, um, STR profiling and mycoplasma testing, a lot of the quality control data comes in early. We also have, this is an example of handwritten lab notes that we can store and reference at a later point here. And all of this has been uploaded by the labs as the experimentation process continues, um, as well as any original raw data files. So CSVs, um, Excel spreadsheets, however that data is collected can be stored in its raw form on the OSF. Um, additionally, we have all of our scripts and analyses and any images that we generate. And all of those are able to be stored compactly in these um, components for each of the project pages. Okay, so once we have the data um, and once it's saved to the OSF, our next step is to move into analyzing this data and generating all of the figures that will eventually be published in the manuscript. So, Making data as open as possible not only includes surfacing this data, but for us it also includes making the data as interpretable as possible. And we want everybody who needs to go back and look at it or who wants to go back and dig into our data to be able to understand it. So one of our goals was to make sure that it was also interpretable analysis and code. Um, as Tim was talking about earlier, when you go through and you read publications and you view those images and those figures, there's often a lot of missing information or missing context. Um, so you could look at a figure in publication and leave with questions like, what did the raw data look like? How many technical replicates were there? How many biological repeats were there? Um, how, if at all, was the data transformed? How was the figure generated, et cetera? So here's an example of how we want to bridge some of those gaps for anybody who wants to view our project in more depth. So this is an example of one of the five that was published. Um, we have a relative tumor volume over days with different cohorts. And looking at this figure in any type of publication might lead someone to ask more questions. So as you can see, this PDF file is stored on the OSF right here, along with all of the other PDF files and supplement figures for this specific protocol. Um, but in addition to that, we also have just below it the analysis script for how this figure was generated. So anybody who wants to view the PDF 
also has access to this analysis script, you can see exactly, um, not only exactly how this PDF was generated, but also as you can see here, we're pulling those data files directly from the OSF. So there are no translation errors between that raw data set, manipulating the data in any way that is necessary in order to create a figure, and when that figure gets into the man manuscript. So you can see here, um, additionally, there's a download button. So if you'd like to download the script or if anybody would like to download the script, they are able to do that. Um, and this is just what it looks like in my R console, but you can see here that we've tried to make this as clear as possible. We have not only the required packages, but we try to label every point throughout the process of these R scripts. Um, additionally, you can see here what I was referencing earlier which is that we're using this get function to pull in all of those original raw data CSV files in order to try to minimize that error. Okay, um, so this is just a more close-up example. I just wanted to hit a few additional points, which was that what we're trying to do with this project, um, specifically with the data analysis, is, well, we use R for all of our analysis figures and scripts because R is easily available, it's open, it aligns with what this project is getting at. Um, all scripts and data files are called directly from the OSF. So like I said, we're trying to minimize that error. We're trying to call everything directly from the source. Um, we try to make all of the necessary libraries and version numbers listed for each script and be sure to label each part of the relevant code. So for right now, what we're doing is we're using the get command to call all data and scripts to the OSF. There is an R for OSF package in the works, and I went ahead and made a link right here if anybody's interested in checking that out. Uh, Tim, I think you also said there's a webinar about that as well. So if anybody's interested in learning a little bit more about that, um, you can go ahead and follow this link at the bottom. Okay, so in addition to trying to make the code not only available, but also understandable and interpretable for anybody who would like to dig deeper. Um, one of the issues that we've encountered or that Tim discussed earlier in trying to build these protocols was often running into representative images and not knowing the context behind those rep representative images. So what we've tried to do is to surface all of that data and all of those images that are so often unable to be serviced in a typical manuscript because of you know space constraints you can't post hundreds of um, hundreds of scans or hundreds of images so right here what you can see is the figure four in one of our replication studies and what we have are we have our bar graph and we have our representative images i think these are both um, prostate and heart tunnel stains so as you can see at the bottom um, there's a link to the OSF and anybody who would like to view in more detail these images or see what they look like in the context of all the other images can follow that link. And so in this example, I followed the link and I wanted to look at um, figure G. So the treated mice, the heart tunnel stain and the treated mice group, mouse group. So as you can see, not only can I now see that image, the representative image, but I can also see all of the other images that we collected during this protocol. Um, and this, this is something that we think is great because in addition to seeing what's published, we can also get all of that relevant background info and context that you just can't get in a regular publication. Um, so yeah, all of our PCD projects will point to their OSF components, which will house all of the relevant data and all of the relevant images, even when we can't necessarily publish them. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a really high level overview generally of how we try to collect and analyze the data in this project. So the next step, once we have all of this data collected and we've um, done all of our predetermined analyses in that registered report, and we've analyzed it and we've generated our figures, now we want to write the actual report. Okay, so, um, oops, sorry about that line, if you can see that. So currently, as Tim mentioned, the norm is to not surface all data and analyses, which can lead to unanswered questions. Um, and as he talked about earlier, you can see I've put this reproducibility spectrum back down here again. So we talked about code, 
and we're kind of moving along this reproducibility spectrum. We talked about trying to surface the code and the data and making sure that this is uh, executable code and data and that it's understandable. Um, but to kind of further that a little bit more, we want to make this accessible for anybody reading through the manuscript. We want there to be um, a trail from the manuscript all the way back down to the raw data files, as well as somebody starting from the raw data files and seeing how we built up to that manuscript. Um, so this is important because reproducibility takes a lot of time and effort on all sides when information is not shared. It's not only a hassle for, you know, the reproducibility team or Tim or RPCB for us to go through and try to figure out and fill in those holes of exactly what steps in the protocol we may be missing. Um, but it's also a lot of time and effort on the side of the original authors who are needing to go back and dig through their data files and um, look through some of the methodology or try to reach out to grad students who may no longer be at that institution. So um, we see more openness and sharing in this type of a project as being beneficial to everybody involved. So once, once we've done that, um, the method that we have taken to try to make our manuscript as reproducible and open as possible is to use our markdown. Um, and this allows us to call all of the scripts, which call all of the raw data files, and pull those into our final markdown, which gets um, rendered to a PDF document and eventually gets published with eLife. So, let's see, going forward, um, you can kind of see the process here with two screenshots. So, we've got our Replication Study 15 RMD file. And we typically use R Markdown, as I said earlier, to pull in all of those R scripts. You can see here that we're downloading um, the scripts as well as trying to label as clearly as possible what each of those objects in R mean and how we're using them. Um, and once we've completed the R Markdown, we render that into a PDF file, which we've saved both on the OSF. So as you can see here on the Files tab for Replication Study 15, we not only have this final PDF version, but we have that, oops, that replication study RMD file. So the goal here is for you to be able to take any p-value, any number, any really any number in the RMD file or in the manuscript, look at the manuscript, pick out a number that you like, look at what that code is that corresponds to that p-value in the R markdown file, and to be able to follow that path to the analysis where it came from, and finally to the raw data file where the data was initially collected. So we're not only trying to build up to that manuscript, but we're also trying to have it be as um, reproducible from the other direction also. We want people to be able to read the manuscript and trace all of those numbers back down to the source or the raw data file. Additionally, we also want to make sure that the manuscript itself is reproducible. So anybody can take this code, put it into their um, R, and run it and have it pop right back up. So that's that's important to us also. Do you have anything else to add on that, Jen? No. All right. So I mean, and that's that's the process of writing up the report. And at that point, it will go through peer review again with eLife before it's finally published. And this is just an example of one of the ones that is actually now published and available on eLife. Not only can you find it on eLife, but you also have that PFD or PDF, sorry, of the final manuscript, as well as the link um, in the manuscript to the project page for the OSF, which will break down all of the components um, in a way similar to what we just talked about. So once we have all of this project, um, wrapped up, we have all of the data, we have all of the analyses, we have the manuscript written. Our final step using the OSF is to go ahead and make this public. And that's as simple as pressing the make public button above. And um, you don't have to do this. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of studies on the OSF who use this as an organizational tool um, that don't make them public, but obviously it's important to our process and our project to go ahead and make this public at the end so that anybody can dig through the data. Um, or the analysis that we talked about today. Um, okay, so let's see. If, if you don't have anything else to add, we can start taking questions, talk a little bit more about the process, or um, 
really anything involved with RPCB. Also, there are additional webinars about the OSF and the one that I spoke about previously with using R in the OSF, and that can be found at this link below. So we had a question from uh, Vishal. Uh, how much information was missing in the methods section? Um, also, how long did it take to get that missing information? That's a great question. So in terms of trying to quantify how much is missing, that's something we'll try to get into at the end of the project. As you can imagine, that is um, going to end up having it be a little bit um, subjective, only in the sense of, you know, how do you, how do you classify how much is enough? Um, but we will try to t um, put this down into certain bins in terms of, you know, data, um, analysis, um, materials, mostly focusing on key ones, um, to methodological details. Um, I'm kind of trying to, trying to figure out some way to look at that across it. Um, one simple answer is every single paper we had at least, you know, at least one. We had multiple questions per experiment for every single paper. Um, and that's just what we asked. Um, there were a lot of times when the author would, you know, when we had engagement would actually give us even more information um, because we didn't even understand, we didn't even know to ask certain questions because that information was lacking. Um, so, so that, that's you know, clear in terms of the sense that we know that there's a lot of missing information. Um, your second question, which is asking about how long did that take us, you know, that was actually in many ways a very troubling aspect of the project for trying to get it to this point. A lot of people you know, thought that we'd be able to get to getting these uh, results a lot sooner, um, but we obviously wanted to make sure that we were taking our time, engaging, um, and uh, working with authors when they were willing to work with us to gather the information. Um, and you know, it was actually, again, very surprising uh, especially when we got great feedback from authors who were willing to give us, you know, the raw data, even their analysis scripts and all those detailed uh, methods. You know, this could take months. Um, we had a couple where it took, you know, a year almost to get to the point where we had the initial email sent out with our, um, you know, kind of first draft with all the questions to that final submitted version. Um, and that's because there's so much back and forth that had to go um, in terms of trying to really make sure that one, we understood it. And two, that they had the time to actually go back and sort through where that information was, because not surprisingly, um, when, you know, at this point, these papers were published and almost everybody who worked on it has left the institution. And so even though they have access to the um, uh, lab notes, you know, they still wanted to go back to the source and actually say, oh, do you actually know where that's located? Um, and I think that actually just kind of speaks a lot, not so much to, oh, that's wrong, right? It's more of just what's our culture like? I mean, we're, we're not really set up for this um, as much as um, maybe we could be. Uh, another point that's wrapped into this is also materials. So there's uh, a lot that's commercially available, and that's fine. And, you know, and if it's not available anymore, you can always find a substitute for most things. Um, but what was tricky also for us was times when we had unique reagents. So take a plasmid as an example of that or a cell line. Um, there were times when we would have, you know, you know, almost, again, up to a year for MTAs to go through. Um, and so, you know, again, I think that speaks to how can we set ourselves up to start putting them in those repositories. You know, there are cell line repositories like ATCC or you know, other ones that are out there. And, and AdGene is a great one for plasmids. Um, and if they had been there, that process would have gone a lot faster because they're already set up to do that type of sharing. Um, and, I, you know, again, I think it just kind of speaks to that's kind of the way we're currently doing things and how can we kind of speed that up. So, yeah, it's a really good question because in many ways that's kind of the heart of it, which is, how long does it take to kind of fully understand what's, what, what we're publishing right now? And the truth is to really understand it. it takes a lot of time in terms of reading it, but even more in terms of trying to get all these details. No, I mean, I think that gets exactly to the efficiency point that we were talking about earlier. I mean, this is, it's, it's not only time consuming for us, but it's time consuming for the original authors. Um, we think that uh, taking these steps to make our data open and at least as available as possible will help to mitigate some of this if anybody wants to dig into our work. Um, okay, so we have another good, a really good question. Tim is, um, Tim, another Tim <laughs> is asking this question. Uh, will it be common practice to try to reproduce a published study from the raw data without first contacting the original authors? Um, or will it be common courtesy to allow the original authors to assist with the reproduction of their experiment? So that's a great question. Um, you know, this, our projects in many ways is already going through both of those. Um, we don't have full 100% um, author engagement. Some you know, chose not to engage with us and there's at least one example where they actually wanted to be arm's length from us because they think that there's more value um, to letting us kind of go at it um, without their input um, and basically using it just from the paper, the raw data, however that is. Um, you know, this gets back at, there's a, there's a lot of people have written on this, what, is the, what are the norms of replication? 
Um, you know, in many ways, I think uh, we need to get as close as we can to putting as much as we can into the original paper without contacting the authors because that's the best way that we can um, move forward. Um, you know, we think of that scalability efficiency approach. Uh, if you have a paper and, or even just a data set um, or methodology that's going to really reach and impact a lot of people, you want to be able to do that without them having to come back to you because otherwise you'd spend all your time uh, uh, answering those questions. But I do think that, you know, especially with the emerging technology, um, which, you know, again, we tried to avoid with this project, but it's still the case, um, or really exciting emerging techniques, um, I think it is nice to still obviously have the ability to communicate um, with the authors, be that via email, phone, or in conferences. I, I don't think we'll ever get away from that, especially when somebody doesn't understand something completely, um, or if they try and they see something, um, they're having kind of especially early issues in the beginning. So I think we'll always end up probably having that, that norm. Um, but I do think that the, the closer and closer we can push to doing it without having to contact authors, that's really good. There was a paper published in 2010 or 12, about then, by Tim Vines. Um, and he was looking at trying to get access of information after papers were published. So they weren't, they weren't actually going to get the information. Um, they were just curious, how easy is it to obtain that information? And so what they did is they set up um, through a handful of papers um, and they did it since the paper was published trying to do this over time. And they were basically just saying, well, one, how often are those email addresses, the corresponding author email addresses correct in papers? And then two, if I actually get through and I can send an email, um, what type of responses do I get? Do I actually have responses where they say, oh yes, I have that information, I'm willing to share it. And what you found is that within five years, it plummets that being able to find the right person and being able to actually have them still be willing to engage drops dramatically. So I think that's all the more reason to keep pushing towards this is because um, you know, that expectation of thinking that I'll always have all that information, um, that's also not realistic as well. Okay, um, there's another question. Is OSF planning to rank publications based on the completeness of the information available for reproducibility? That's a really cool question. So we, we're, we're not, um, as far as I know, we're not, we're not looking to rank publications, but we do have something that I think you'd find very interesting that's related to that question, which is the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines. So this is a journal initiative, uh, largely a journal initiative. It's also focused at funders. And these are policy changes that journals can make to increase the transparency and uh, openness. And, and in essence, that leads to reproducibility, right? The more transparent and rigorous we are, the more reproducible we are um, in terms of that computational empirical standpoint. Um, and uh, we're working with journals to implement that because then that not so much allows you to rank the publications, but it does allow you to get a better idea of what are journal policies and how do those papers, um, uh, how are they reflected uh, uh, or at least, sorry, let me rephrase that, how those, how those journals, uh, those papers um, uh, are viewed in light of those policies, right? So you can imagine that if you have a journal that says, yes, you need to have all your code and all of your analysis scripts publicly available at time of publication, those will more than likely be more reproducible. Uh, the cool thing about that is we can actually start to test that as these policies get implemented, right? Do these policies actually lead to more reproducible research? And I think that'd be a really fun question. Um, another way of doing this, so again, not ranking, but trying to acknowledge is uh, we also have badges. Mozilla Science Lab has badges as well, and we're working with groups to figure out a way to uh, reward um, these type of practices. Um, and so these are not done um, by the journal at, in terms of a, a, a need for acceptance, right? You don't have to make your data available to have your paper accepted. But at the time of publication, if your data are public, you can get awarded this badge. Um, and it really is, it's, it's kind of like a gold sticker, um, but it's an easy way to recognize that open practice. And so that's another way to kind of not so much rank, but at least allow you to easily see well, what papers are um, kind of abiding by these best practices, because that's an easier way of assessing that instead of having to constantly spend all this time diving in and saying, do they have the data available? Where are these, you know, where can I find it? Um, this allows a quick signal to say, oh yes, that paper right there, before I even read the paper, I know that they've made their data available or I know they've pre-registered um, their studies beforehand. And then we have another question from Adam, a uh, great presentation project. Have you received any feedback from original authors or the journal that published the article where the original study hasn't been quite replicated? It's a really good question. Um, so, yes, that's a really good question. Um, so there's a couple things. So we, 
at all times throughout the project are trying to engage the authors. Um, that's the that's kind of the practice we decided to take to that. So again, getting back to that question, uh, original, you know, is that a requirement or not? That, that's a good debate to have, but we decided to want to engage at all levels because we know that we'll have the best chance to succeed if we do. Um, and of course, at the end, you know, once the results are known, once you have the results, um, yeah, that at that point, it's more of speculation of like, well, what might have what what might account for a discrepancy if a discrepancy exists, which is what your question is getting at. And so every single author, um, whether we had engagement with them or not, um, we made sure, and we did this jointly with eLife, we made sure that they had access to these papers prior to them being published. Um, so again, one thing to note back that I didn't mention in the registry reports model is not only do we try to engage with the original authors uh, to kind of informally gather this information, but eLife also had them engaged, at least one original author engaged as a formal peer reviewer of both the registered reports, so that methodology, and the replication study, the results. But on top of that, we also shared the paper, just to really try to make sure we, we crossed off all of our um, uh, you know, possibilities of not having that communication go through. And at that same time, eLife offer, offered for those original authors to comment on the paper, um, which, um, at least for these first five, three of the five authors, I believe, commented on the papers, and you can see those comments, those post-publication comments, uh, and of course, add your own um, at eLife as well as on Pub, uh, PubMed Commons. And the, basically, the feedback that we get, I think, is very good feedback, right? They're basically looking at those results and trying to put them back into the context. Uh, one thing that we definitely want to make sure that's noted in this is just like the original study is a single data point, it's a single study, um, you know, because publishing drug replications is not the norm, you know, this is another. And so we need to start having more of an understanding that these are two data points. And if they are in disagreement with each other on some level, um, it doesn't necessarily mean one's right, one's wrong. That is a possibility, right? False positive, false negative, um, or, or error. Um, but it also points more to, well, if there's a discrepancy, why? We didn't, have a, we didn't have a reason to think there was going to be, and if there is, that actually potentially leads to the opportunity to say, well, how can we remedy this? Because you know, it's quite possible that they're both correct, um, but we're missing that information. Um, we've not heard from the original journals. Um, you know, we've not uh, purposely reached out to them. Uh, we gave that, we suggested to the corresponding authors when we shared information with them that, you know, they should seek whatever stakeholders they see necessary to share this with, you know, be that other authors of the original paper, journals, funders, whoever they want. Um, but we purposely did not seek those um, just because, you know, again, this may or may not have any reflection of the journals. Um, this is more of just the sampling of the literature that we're pulling from. But that's a great question. Thank you. Do you have anything you want to add to that? No, that's great. Um, so another question is asked, why is information usually missing? Could it be deliberate, a lack of space, like a word limit for uh, you know, a certain publication format? That's a really good question. Um, so there's a lot of answers to that. So I can tell you one that we've seen, um, you know, I, I know from my own personal experience, but we also had a come up with a couple of replications is uh, kind of a quote that I had in the beginning, which is that nuance got lost during revisions, during space restrictions. It's, isn't that amazing that even now with, you know, almost every single journal, even though they still, you know, some of them like Nature Science still do prints, they all have online and they all have supplemental space that we still have restrictions on in terms of number of figures and space for methods or even just any other type of detail. Um, so I think sometimes this is occurring not because somebody's doing it on deliberate, just because right now there's so much time spent on formatting and getting these things into uh, the necessary conditions to get it submitted, let alone accepted into a paper, um, that this information starts to get lost pretty quickly. Right? We have such an emphasis right now in our culture on those outcomes, which are which is important, but we forget that the why, what you're asking, is 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 left behind, um, and and that's just as valuable to understanding the outcome as the outcome itself. Um, so I think that that gets you know speaks back to how can we you know kind of shift those incentives um, by having either journals require it, um, or probably what's easier is to create more space. And in some ways, that's what we're doing. Even though eLife is quite liberal with their space, it's actually quite hard to even capture all that information into a digestible format such as a text file. And so as Alex was kind of pointing out, what we're trying to do, and I think I'd recommend this for anybody, is start to augment your um, publication um, with other repositories, other means to share that information. So that way that why doesn't get lost, um, especially since that why is always done before you write the paper up for publication. Um, now, in terms of deliberate, 
you know, it's really hard to ever tell if it's deliberate or not. I think there are times, especially in biomed, where we see space where IP comes into play. Um, we had that occur with a couple of virus, but it was never a sticking point um, because if there was some IP where they couldn't say share a material or share a process with us, they usually share that downstream material with us. So, you know, we can't quite ask how reproducible that, you know, intellectual property is, um, but that's, but there's always going to be some limitation on every single experiment that we're doing. Um, so that's not so much deliberate because they're trying to hide, but that's deliberate because they're trying to protect. Um, I think also yeah. in a more abstract sense, there's a discussion happening right now that'll probably be field specific as to what actually is the level of detail necessary to share in these papers. And I think that's yeah. an ongoing discussion that, that we're gonna need to look more into because um, you can imagine there being a variable that we didn't understand was necessary to replicate a study until you know we're halfway through the study. So, I think that's also a conversation that needs to happen and is happening and will continue to happen. Right, and I think that's something else that everybody can engage with, because um, you're absolutely right. There's this question of how, how much is enough. Um, and you know, again, I think there's a couple ways to think about that. One is, well, there probably is for certain types of method, methodologies where there is a certain limited threshold and people have started to define those. Um, I think what might be the healthier way to think about this is, how, how much can I capture? Right, so even though I think it's important, I don't know who else is gonna need, use this. And it could be myself in the future or it could be somebody else because we're obviously doing these experiments not because we're trying to say, oh, I found something. It's, this is how I found something. Um, and so the more that we can share and the easier we can make that, and the more we can automate it, I think these, these questions will start to shift over time. Um, and right now, I mean, think about this. We can now have online repositories like you know the Open Science Framework supplement the way we publish. That wasn't possible, you know, 20 years ago, or at least, you know, kind of was, but it wasn't really possible. Um, and we, that's why we used peer paper publications. And that's why, you know, the, we, we only had limitations because we were always putting things in print. We couldn't publish all of the material because it'd be impossible to do that and disseminate it through, you know, actual physical uh, journals. Um, so that already tells you that technology continues to play a role in this and we should be embracing it more and more. And I'm sure in another 10 years, we'll have different questions, but still around similar um, points as these. Uh -huh, here's a good question. Uh, so Tim asks, if you encountered an error in one of the stories, would you try to remedy the error or would you proceed to replicate including the error? Um, and then of course the question becomes, it would still be a replication of findings of sorts if the error was not remedied. So that's a really good question. Um, and you know, if there was a, a Slate article written about you know this project, but also kind of about you know replication in general, that was trying to hit at that same point. Dan Engber wrote the article; it's a nice one to read. And um, I remember talking to him at one point. He asked something very similar, which is uh, he was trying to think of it in terms of like cell lines. He's like, if the cell line's contaminated, do you follow through with that contaminated cell line, or do you stop and say I can't replicate it because it's contaminated, or you know, or do you remedy that and then move forward and recognize that maybe the reason you can't see it is because of the contamination. Um, and, and that's an easy, that's a relatively easy one because there's a norm that says don't use contaminated cell lines. It gets a lot trickier as you start to go down into um, all these different types of techniques and, and approaches. Our general approach with the project has been to do everything the same way because we want to be able to understand, even given the fact that we don't fully understand or the authors might not have fully understood at the time they did the study, limitations of their materials, such as, an, and we'll say an error in terms of, you know, uh, antibody they used was the wrong, it detected the wrong antigen. We still want to repeat that mistake because we want to basically say, even if they found that error, can we repeat that error? Um, generally though, when we found something that was uh, not something like, you know, a missing, a missing control, for instance, uh, generally we would include that, or, the, or peer reviewers would ask us to include that because there is that fundamental problem of saying, well, geez, you know, maybe that original should have had this, they didn't do it, but you guys need to do this because otherwise now we're, we're completely missing this. Um, and we always tried to include those in there uh, because we see that, you know, there, and there is, it's always true for replication, you can add value, not just about that original effect, but you can also start to augment off of it. Uh, we of course have to balance that with the project because, you know, we can't do that for everything that's better for the community, but we do try to pick that up on certain issues where you know, there is this kind of error that's missing. Um, sometimes what we'll see is, we don't always get all access to it, but sometimes you'll see, you know, statistical errors, for instance. Um, we only had a couple where it was completely the wrong test. 
Um, and when those occur, you know, we would not obviously repeat that error because that's just completely incorrect. Um, generally, what it would be is a disagreement about ways one could do it. So we'd follow the same approach, which is we'll follow the way that you did it. Um, however, since there's not a norm in the field um, or there's maybe a shifting norm in the field, we'll also conduct it another way and make sure that we're powered for both of those analyses. Um, so again, always trying to do this balancing act of saying, can we do it exactly the same way while also recognizing that you know, we will potentially be adding in new methodologies? Um, um, so I hopefully that answers your question. Um, it, it does make a really interesting point, which is when that, when that occurs, right, what, what are you comparing? Um, and again, whenever we do these, um, we always try to make sure that we compare as directly as we can from the original and the replication, because that's where the value is gained. And if it turns out you added an additional control and it sheds new light on it, but that wasn't done in the original, um, what, then what you've done is you've done a, you know, hopefully a good thing, which is you've added more knowledge. Now the question is, is that reproducible itself? I don't want to add anything else. Yeah, no, um, I would just add that anything that we do tweak, as Tim mentioned, um, we do try to surface in the same way that we would surface any of this confirmatory, these confirmatory analysis that we're trying to reproduce. We would also surface these exploratory um, additional variables that we sometimes add. And I think that's a really good point because, um, you know, especially in biology, we're great at doing conceptual replications and hitting kind of things from multiple angles, which is vital. It's vital for us to understand things. And, and generally, when we see somebody's methodology, we, we tend to quickly uh, adjust what we see as flaws in it, or as we see as just, you know, hindrances of like, why did they do it that way? You know, I should do it my own way. Um, and that's really helpful. That's really good because it kind of gets at that robustness and it gets you at that understanding. Um, but something that's important is to remember that, you know, we can sometimes be, you know, led the wrong way. And that's why doing things the same way is actually very helpful to get that real clear understanding of what was that actual effect? Can I obtain that, uh, that actual effect? Because otherwise, if we keep shifting it, which is important, we keep making this assumption that each time we do it, it's true. But we don't know that unless we actually test it. Um, so it's a, it's a fine balancing act. Um, and I think it's always important to consider both. So thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, as Tim mentioned, the webinar will be, uh, has been being recorded. We'll post it on the Center for Open Science YouTube channel where you can also find um, all of our old webinars as well as the OSR webinar that Tim mentioned. Um, if you have any questions after the webinar, feel free to shoot us an email, contact at cos.io, and we'll be happy to answer it. Um, so thanks so much for uh, the great questions and for joining the webinar this afternoon.